Okay, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second day of the conference on the future of Europe organized by the law department and the politics department of the College of Europe and uh, together with the European Law Journal. Um, this is the second day. Uh, we have still over 1400 registrations. I see that the number of participants this morning, Friday morning, keeps on increasing. So I hope more will join uh, as we go along. And uh, my name is Siglindik Stuhl. I'm the Director of Studies of the EU International Relations and Diplomacy Department at the College of Europe. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me um, for this great conference. And I already followed it yesterday. So this morning, uh, we will have a first panel that will look into two topics of EU external action, the common commercial policy and the common foreign and security policy. It's still part of the what we started yesterday and what kind of political project the EU should be for the future. The second part will then start after this panel. Um, for each topic, we have one speaker and then two commentators that I would like to introduce uh, briefly first. Uh, of course, the two areas have been uh, picked widely. Both trade and the CFSP are facing many challenges right now if I would name just a few, we have the global power shifts, uh, an undermining of the rules-based multi multilateral system and order, trade wars, armed conflicts, hybrid threats, the COVID-19 pandemic, sustainability, climate change issues, and the overlap or let's say nexus between the different policy fields and what that means for the effectiveness, coherence, etc. And I think these are some of the issues that we might tackle today. But the EU institutions have, of course, been busy also thinking about the future. So the Commission is, for instance, currently working on a EU trade policy review that will probably also come up in the discussion. And there are also proposals concerning the CFSP, such as a move from unanimity to qualify majority voting in some areas of the CFSP, for instance, sanctions. And then for both areas, there's also this buzzword right now, this discussion about European sovereignty or, as I prefer, <laughs> strategic autonomy or open strategic autonomy and what does this mean uh, for the future of Europe. So we will, uh, I will first introduce the two speakers. Uh, we have Philippe de Barre, who is a partner at the leading law firm von Berlin Bellis in Brussels. Uh, he is a graduate of the University of Leuven and a very experienced practitioner of WTO trade law as well as EU trade and customs law. And then we have Ramses Wessel, who is Professor of European Law and also Vice Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Groningen. He is, among other things, also the editor of the European Foreign Affairs Review. Uh, and then if we move to the panelists, uh, I would like to start then in the order of the presentation. So we first have the two commentators for trade and then the two on the CFSP. So the panel will then start with Jacques Pelkmans, uh, who is a Professor of Economics and a senior fellow at SEPS in Brussels, specialized in EU trade and investment policy, the single market and EU regulation. Uh, he has held many positions, so I can't <laughs> uh, name them all. But among other things, he was also director of studies of the economics department at the College of Europe in the past. And we have Guillaume van der Loo, is a research fellow at the Egmont Institute and the European Policy Center in Brussels, as well as a visiting professor for EU trade law. Uh, at Kent University. Then uh, Christoph Fillion is a research professor at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs in Oslo. I think he's probably joining us from Oslo today, uh, but he's also professor of European law at the Universities of Leiden and uh, Gothenburg and researcher at the Swedish Institute for European Policy Studies in Stockholm. Last but not least, he's also an alumnus of the College of Europe, if I may say so. <laughs> And then we have uh, Juan Manuel Sanchez, who's a current student at the College of Europe um, of the Department of European Political and Governance Studies. So each speaker has 10 minutes and then the panelists should please stick to five minutes reactions as a first round. And please only unmute yourself when it is your turn to speak to have uh, a good communication. Uh, the audience should please also remember that they can submit questions by typing them into the chat function. And my colleague Inge Govare will then in the Q&A session group them a little bit and, and, and read them out so that the panelists and the speakers get a chance to react to them. 
Uh, so I would, uh, before further ado, pass on to Philippe de Barre for the pres presentation related to trade, please. Let me start by thanking the organizers uh, for the invitation to this very interesting and timely conference. Uh, I was a bit scared listening to Siglinda's introduction because uh, um, she listed quite a number of uh, very important and very, very relevant topics. Uh, the big problem will be how to fit them in the 10 minutes time uh, allotment. Um, let me try. So, uh, let me try first by, by discussing what I see as the current challenges uh, that the EU is facing uh, in developing an effective and coherent trade policy uh, in the current uh, circumstances. Uh, and uh, then look at what kind of uh, proposals are on the table or what kind of actions have already been taken and to what extent these can be actually useful uh, in achieving the objectives of uh, the EU's trade policy. Um, as we all know, uh, a lot has changed uh, since uh, Commissioner Malmström uh, issued her last communication on trade policy, uh, which was called um, uh, Trade for All in uh, 2015. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, the, the, the environment has completely been modified by a number of actors that Siglinde already pointed out, uh, the emergence of new trade powers, uh, a different shift in the analysis made uh, of its national interest by the United States, etc. At the time, however, of uh, Commissioner Malmström's uh, uh, communication trade for all, uh, we were living in a relatively quiet period. Uh, we were operating uh, in uh, under uh, what has become the uh, buzzword, namely uh, um, the multilateral rules-based uh, system, trading system. Uh, which was mainly governed by WTO rules, um, where you had uh, uh, regular disputes, but uh, they were um, uh, not very political, they were highly technical, they were submitted to the WTO dispute settlement uh, mechanism, and in fact uh, were uh, mostly related to the application of trade defense instruments. In addition to the WTO and the use of, I would say, trade defense instruments, uh, we saw a number of negotiations going on uh, in order to conclude uh, free trade agreements or regional free trade agreements, uh, which had to comply, obviously, with, uh, with Article 24 of the GATT uh, 1994. In other words, trade policy uh, was highly legalized and one could call it depoliticized. It was rules-based. Uh, there was a crazy judicial dispute settlement. There was a high compliance rate uh, with decisions of the dispute settlement body. And there was a kind of consensus that this system was actually legitimate. Uh, there was a consensus on the benefits of free trade, uh, whereby everybody accepted that trade created wealth and actually was an instrument of fostering world peace. Since 2015, and it's rather... Uh, ideal uh, representation of what was trade policy at the time or the, or the trade relations at the time, we have seen that this consensus has been shattered. Uh, we have seen the emergence of uh, national security considerations in trade policy. Uh, there's been a higher importance given to uh, so-called non-economic values. Um, trade policy has become an instrument for some countries to, to advance the political agenda. And we have seen that due to the emergence of China, and um, mainly China, but also not only China, uh, it has become extremely difficult uh, to achieve uh, new international negotiations and to achieve new international rules. So we have seen a breakdown of the legislative function uh, of the WTO. It is in these circumstances that the EU had to come up with a new trade policy. It has entitled this new policy or these proposals uh, Open Strategic Autonomy, as Siglinde already referred to. Uh, I must say it's not a very nice title, uh, Open Strategic Autonomy. And in fact, it seems to have been created to include under its umbrella very different and sometimes contradictory policy objectives. What are these objectives? And what are the instruments the EU has or envisages to use to achieve these objectives? 
I see five, basically five objectives, five different objectives that uh, the open strategic auto autonomy policy tries to achieve. Two of them are, I would say, traditional. Three could be qualified as new objectives. Uh, the first one uh, is obviously the protection and the shoring up of the multilateral rule-based system, uh, the WTO system. The second one is the promotion of trade and the protection of the European industry. Uh, these are very traditional uh, objectives of a trade policy. Uh, new ones are a new emphasis on the protection of uh, national security. Another objective is ensuring a level of playing field. Uh, and the fifth one I would call, say, that the defense of so-called non-trade related uh, core values of the EU. Let me briefly go through this list. First, the defense of the multilateral, multilateral rule-based system. What we have seen uh, since 2015, and especially during the last four years, is a breakdown of the WTO system and more in general of a multilateral uh, agreements of multilateral agreements as a tool for uh, uh, international trade regulation. Um, the most uh, well-known examples of this breakdown are obviously uh, the, uh, uh, the blocking of the applet body by the refusal by the US of naming uh, uh, applet body members, judges, uh, the blocking by the US of the appointment of a new director general. Uh, this is very, very worrying for the EU because obviously the EU uh, has, uh, is a, a world player in the field of trade, uh, but has a very low strategic rate. And the EU realizes that, uh, or should realize that, uh, in the absence of a multilateral rule-based system, uh, where we go back to a kind of power-based uh, trade po policy, uh, it stands to lose tremendously compared to the current situation. So the EU has, has made several efforts uh, to uh, come up with alternatives or to keep the system going. Uh, they have promoted, uh, instead of the applet body, the multi-party interim arbitration agreement, another horrible name, uh, to replace the applet body. Um, they have come up with uh, ideas for the uh, um, a multilateral investment court to replace the uh, uh, so-called traditional investor state dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, they have been supporting discussions in the OECD uh, in relation to tax base erosion. And within uh, the WTO, but also outside the WTO, there have been initiatives taken by the EU to come to a reform of the WTO system. All of this has been rather unsuccessful. Uh, so at the moment, uh, I would say that even though the EU is making big efforts to uh, um, get the WTO system uh, operational again, uh, it has not been very successful in, in, in that field. A second objective is obviously the defense of the domestic industry. Uh, and there we see that several uh, more aggressive uh, steps have been taken by the EU in reforming its uh, trade defense instrument, uh, but also in taking actions which uh, uh, can be considered as manifestly uh, incompatible with the WTO rules. And maybe the weakening of the multilateral system has in fact also in a certain sense encouraged the EU in that. For instance, the imposition of safeguard measures on steel products in re, after the imposition of uh, uh, the national security measures by the, by the US. Uh, we have uh, the so-called trade bazooka, uh, the enforcement regulation, which would allow the EU to adopt uh, retaliatory measures without having to wait for a final decision of the WTO dispute settlement, etc. As to the new objectives, we have seen for the national security uh, measures, which we see uh, initiatives that have been taken in relation to foreign direct investment screening, uh, creation of national champions uh, by relaxation of merger control rules for uh, European mergers. Uh, we have talked about reshoring uh, production uh, in strategic sectors like pharma, but also the tech industry. Um, we have seen state aid for uh, strategic industries like battery, electric battery production. Uh, so the EU is also in that uh, field uh, 
taking into account much more its national security interests, uh, even though these may conflict with uh, WTO rules. A fourth very important development has been the increasingly externalization of the WTO internal norms and standards. Um, you could describe that as an effort of creating a level playing field by making sure that foreign companies and foreign economic agents have to comply with rules which impose equivalent burdens on them as the EU imposes on their own uh, operators. Uh, examples of such proposals are the carbon border adjustment mechanism, um, which uh, uh, would put a burden on importers or imported products similar to the uh, uh, emission trading system. We have the white paper on uh, foreign subsidies. Uh, we have the so-called adequacy decisions in the context of the, the uh, data protection rules. Uh, so it's, it's actually, uh, these are a few examples, but it's a wider phenomenon that in the absence of the difficulty in creating multilateral rules, the EU gradually adopts more unilateral actions to make sure that uh, the uh, uh, foreign uh, producers and importers uh, are subject to similar uh, burdens. And then finally, we have seen that more and more, and certainly under the uh, under the impetus and the influence of the European Parliament, that there is an increasing linkage between trade policy and so-called non-trade values. Uh, the idea is that trade policy should be value-driven. And we have seen this in the discussions now about the comprehensive agreement on investment with China. Uh, we have seen it in the recent, uh, in the recent panel report on uh, uh, the EU-Korea FTA on labor rights, and we see it recently also in a court in court cases relating to uh, the occupied territories, uh, Western Sahara and West Bank. Now it's clear that all these objectives uh, are are uh, cannot be given the same weight or cannot be pursued uh, at the same time. Uh, some of them are contradictory, and therefore I think it's extremely important that the European Union. Uh, somehow uh, achieves uh, a kind of hier hierarchy between these, norm these norms. And I will leave the discussion of what kind of hierarchy we should arrive at uh, for the later discussion with the panelists. But let me just say that, uh, in my view, uh, the biggest risk to an effective and coherent uh, trade policy comes from an excessive linkage between non-trade related values and the objective of promoting trade through international agreements. And by doing so, we will be mixing up uh, the uh, EU trade policy with uh, uh, issues which are better dealt with in the context of the common foreign and security policy. And uh, therefore, I think that uh, we should certainly look at uh, what is happening in cases like, for instance, the recent case before the General Court, uh, Moorhout uh, versus Commission, uh, where there is uh, an express attempt is being made of bringing uh, sanctions and, uh, uh, and measures that should be adopted in accordance with Article 215 uh, under the umbrella of the, uh, uh, of the common commercial policy. I leave it at that, and I think that we will probably discuss this further uh, in the panel, during the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. I think so too. <laughs> Article 21T, of course, does not give you a, a hierarchy of external action goals, so that's a very important question. Uh, for the audience, I would just like to remind that you should use the Q&A section, of course, for the for posting your questions, just to be more precise, okay? And I will, for, before uh, losing more time, move on to the CFSP topic and give the floor to Ramses Vessel, please. Thank you very much, uh, Siglinda. Let me give me a minute to see if I can share my, um, my PowerPoint, which should be visible for you now. Um, so thanks very much uh, to the chair, Siglinda, and also to the organizers of the conference. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me uh, and asking me to, uh, to, to talk about a topic that has been um, haunting me, I think, for the last 25 years or so. And it seems to come back. And every time I think I'm never going to write anything on CFSP again, then there's something new happening. So I have to. And it will probably stick with me for the, uh, for the rest of my life. Well, it's a nice topic, and as you can see, we're writing a paper. I'm doing it together with the people that you see on this uh, slide. So I have a, a, a small team 
um, that we work uh, with on this uh, on this topic, also in the framework of uh, of an H uh, twenty twenty project, which is called Engage, which you can see here. Um, so just a few preliminary remarks, if you allow me, um, on something that, at least in legal circles, is called the normalization um, of, of CFSB. Um, what do we mean by normalization? Basically, also something similar that Philippe just mentioned, legalization. Huh? He was talking about legalization of the trade policy. Um, and, and to a certain extent, normalization of CFSB is also related to legalization of, of, of CFSB. And that is not a that is not a process that just started. Basically, that that process was there from the outset uh, when CVSP was created. Still, it's been seen as still huh, the odd one out. I've been writing on this uh, on this thing um, already for many years, and and in that respect, in the image of CVSP has not changed that much. It's still seen as the odd one out. You see a few reasons here: huh? the mentioning in Article 24 of the special rules and procedures. Um, which would set CFSP apart from anything else, um, not using the legislative procedure, uh, the, the, the so-called old-fashioned community method um, is, no, is not used in CFSP. Um, and that is part of why people see CFSP differently. And we have seen changes um, there. Um, it has become, CFSP has become more and more part of the union's legal order. Um, principles and rules uh, in the European Union apply across the board, including CFSP. And you just mentioned Sigli in Article 21. And indeed, if we look at Article 21, we see that these external objectives are new, more uh, are more comprehensively presented. Last but not least in this normalization process, of course, is the role of the courts. Um, over the past, let's say, decade or so, we've seen a number of cases, and you see a few of them mentioned here, in, in which the court actually said, um, listen, um, I, I'm facing this um, exclusion of my jurisdiction in the treaty, but at the same time, I see that I have a role to play in legal protection. I choose to play that role in legal protection because I find that more important and I interpret the exclusion uh, of my jurisdiction very restrictively. And that has led to a number of cases uh, in, in which we gradually saw that the court um, recognized, I would say, uh, its its jurisdiction in this uh, in this field. So the paper that we're writing is um, has a, has a number of objectives. Um, so one of them is actually that CVSP, although it is very well functioning, um, is still perceived as not functional at all, and that has to do largely with uh, political reasons, of course, uh, but also with some some legal reasons. So what we try to do is we try to find um, reasons. Uh, why it is not working, um, and I will come back to, to a number of those reasons uh, perhaps in a, in a minute. If you look at the current treaty, um, CVSP is, was a compromise in the beginning, right? So it has still remained a compromise. Um, it's not to create foreign policy per se. There's no obligation to reach uh, a common policy in foreign policy. There's an obligation to try and, and, and come to a policy uh, in, in foreign policy. If it doesn't if it doesn't work out in the end, um, then that is not against the treaty rules. Uh, it would be politically um, not very helpful, but legally there would not be something wrong. Um, and, and one of the discussions that is going on is, should we make CVSP more mandatory for the, for the member states? And I'll come back to that as well. So another part of the paper um, is based on, on, on a database that we have been building with this small team that I just uh, mentioned. Um, and let me be frank, I would never have thought that I would have used the term database in any of my presentations. Um, but we're actually counting things now. And what we are counting is, um, is indeed CVSP decisions, but also looking at the topics. Um, have the topics changed over time? Has the, have the, uh, the subjects, the ge geography, has that changed over time? Um, so what has CVSP been engaged with? And that is the first step for us to see also what should be changed and where perhaps we can also change a few uh, a few things uh, to improve uh, effectiveness. Um, so just to give you some idea, I mean the paper has a, has numbers uh, has a number of examples, but Ukraine, for instance, stands out as uh, as the most frequently addressed state. Uh, that is to me that was a surprise, and we. I find that very interesting, and we have to look uh, how that is and then why that is. 
Um, if you look at regions, it's, it's really the Middle East, um, looking at CSDP, the Common Security and Defense Policy. Uh, Mali was uh, the country receiving the most attention, um, with Somalia being second, and in general, the, the entire West, uh, Western Africa, West African region um, had received a lot of attention uh, by the European Union in the area of, of CSDP. So these are the things that we, we try to figure out to see, okay, if there's a criticism on CSDP, is there, is there also something that we can point to that has not been done, for instance, or has it focused too much on, on certain regions rather and, and left others out? And, and are there any possibility to change that? Um, uh, being lawyers, of course, we have also looked at legal basis. So we have listed all the legal basis that were used uh, for the CFS, for all CFSP decisions over the past 10 years. And most of them, um, uh, well, many of them, at least nearly half of them, are based on Article 29. Uh, a number of them are Article 31. Just to explain to, to, to the non-lawyers, this means that in, in principle, uh, almost, uh, well, the, the large majority, let's say 70% or so, um 80 percent is is based um on on treaty oh sorry is is related to sanctions and that is interesting to see that is something that we already felt and that is also something that politically i think is interesting um if cvsp is mainly about sanctions uh could you perhaps argue that it's its focus is on sort of negative foreign policy rather than on positive foreign policy it doesn't constructively do something but it, its main goal seems to be to, to punish other states. Is, is that really what we want? Is other other things, are there other possibilities for us to change that? Um, we've also been looking at the um, and the CSDP legal base, of course. And then, of course, is the surprise one it will not come as a surprise that most of the decisions are actually EU, concerning EU missions. So the establishment of EU civilian and, and military missions. And you see a number of the uh, of the articles mentioned here and, and, and percentages. Um, there are other CSDP um, um, decisions, of course, on just military missions. You can conclude international agreements to allow other states to participate in EU uh, military missions, for instance. Uh, but those decisions are just a minority in the overall uh, overview. So the question that the paper then, then, then raises is, is what can we improve? Is there anything that we can do as lawyers to, to help out uh, in this future of Europe? Uh, conference to come up with suggestions on what to what to do, and and one of those elements, of course, uh, one of those possible improvements has to do with institutional change. Um, if you look at the debate over the past few years, you see that some of the colleagues have mentioned, and also the institutions, by the way, a larger role for the institutions that are now largely left out of CSP. Um, would it be possible to to involve the Commission uh, more? Would it be possible to involve the European Parliament more? Um, keeping in mind uh, that the European Parliament, although it is officially um, not part of the legislative procedure in CFSP, it is one of the most active, our parliaments, if not the most active one in the world on foreign policy. Um, so it has been very active. It has very good ideas. Should we make more use of that in, in a formal sense um, as well? Decision making, and, and, and Siglindo already mentioned that there is a discussion going on, on on the gradual implementation of qualified majority voting. Um, is that possible or not? Um, well, 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 we'll take a look at that. Enhanced cooperation, should we use more flexibility, allowing smaller groups uh, to go ahead and, and not being um, held back in a way by, by one or two states uh, that are less eager uh, to pursue these policies? And, and finally, uh, would there be possibilities to integrate CFSP and non-CFSP foreign policies uh, a bit more? And, that could be part of our discussion later on, as Philippe just mentioned, that he would not be a fan of having uh, foreign policy or human rights elements in, in trade policy. So what are the options? I mean, there are many options, and, and I'm listing just a few of them, and you can read the rest in the paper. Um, for lawyers, there's one interesting thing, and that is called the passerelle clauses. They're in 30, Article 31 of the Treaty on the European Union. They're sometimes called the sleeping beauty of the treaty because they have not really been used, but they allow, as you can see here, the European Council to decide that in certain areas or for certain decisions, qualified majority voting can be used in CSP. Of course, that European Council decision will have to be taken by unanimity. That will be interesting. And if you look at the, at the documents, for instance, produced by the Commission, but also by, by some of my, my colleagues, you see that 
they see possibilities for, for qualified majority voting in, for instance, the area of sanctions and human rights, um, uh, civilian mi missions in CSDP. Um, would that be possible at all? That is one of the questions. I'm personally, um, but that's again for the discussion, I'm really not sure if Q QMV really would do the trick. Uh, but I'll come back to that perhaps in my final slide, which will come up in almost uh, a minute. Um, questions to be addressed uh, also is, um, um, could the, um, well, what is the relationship between this passerelle clause and the uh, revision procedures that are in the treaty in Article 48? Can you actually single out CFSP or should you also see this perhaps as a, as a lex specialis of the revision procedure? Those are legal questions at least that we need to, uh, need to address. What about the role of the court uh, in these situations? Uh, and indeed the effect on, on, on QMV uh, on the legitimacy of, of foreign policy, something to be discussed perhaps during the, um, during the discussion. If you have a decision being taken by, by a majority of the member states and, and two or three are, are not happy with it and, and also express their, their negative feelings uh, about a certain decision, will that really help uh, in having a common policy of the European Union? That's an open question. Um, treaty amendments, is that possible? Can we actually treat, uh, see, look again at, 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 at treaty changes? I mean, you know that the Conference on the Future of Europe has indicated, at least in the preparation, it has been indicated uh, that this will not lead to a treaty change. At least it should not be seen as a formal treaty revision procedure. Uh, but still, uh, one of the uneasy un feelings I still have is the CFSP, that is, it's part of the TEU and not of the TFEU. It's in a separate treaty. Why is it in a separate treaty? It doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense at the time. Yes, politically, but not legally. And it does not make sense at all uh, these days. Um, so integrating CFSP, and you can hold on to, if you want, your special rules and procedures to some extent, if you move everything to, to one single comprehensive treaty. Um, so, Oh, sorry, that was already my uh, my final slide. I'm now trying to stop sharing and get back to you, um, Siglinda. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ramses, for putting so many ideas on the table. I'm sure there will be <laughs> reactions to that. Um, and I would just go ahead and uh, open uh, the panel discussion by uh, starting with Jacques Pelkmans um, to react to the trade presentation in particular. Thank you, Siglinde. Um, five minutes is really very little, so I will not start thanking everybody, but immediately hit the road. I want to make two points. That's already a lot in five minutes. Uh, one is, and that follows Ramses uh, very closely, in case there might be a, uh, a treaty change of some kind, although it's very tiring to think of a treaty change, but nonetheless, uh, if that were to happen, then my first recommendation would be don't change trade policy a lot. That's the first point. Trade policy, or rather trade and investment policy as it is nowadays, is very successful. And I could spend also two hours on this. But there are many indications that it is uh, one of the uh, best instruments the EU has. And it has worked in markets and for the economy. And indeed, to some extent, not fully, uh, also socially, uh, in a very great way. Um, there is the famous statistic that 36 million jobs directly depend on trade in the EU. But even if you just zoom in on EU-China, it's just an example. Um, and a number of years ago, uh, we did some work on, on EU-China in very great detail. And economists nowadays don't do that with normal trade statistics, but with value-added trade statistics. That means that the trade can directly, also the indirectly, all be coupled to all the jobs related in one way or the other with trade, both import and export. And these figures are phenomenal. Our exports, and we talk about data of 2011 because it takes a lot of time before you get newer data, um, over 3 million jobs in the EU dependent on the export uh, to China, but also 1.1 million jobs dependent on the imports from China. And in China itself, it was 5.5 million jobs. Um, there are a number of other things that you could say, but just 
it's phenomenally positive what these kind of things do. Um, and also is true for FDI, for foreign direct investment. Uh, between one third and 40%, because we don't have new statistics, of all the exports of China to us come from European enterprises in China. And so FDI and trade are very closely related. In the EU US relationship, uh, roughly half of all goods trade between the US and the EU is inside firms that have invested from the EU and the US on both sides. So it's not just trade, it's trade, services, and foreign direct investment and it's mightily successful. Some people have sometimes argued, partly correctly, partly I would say uh, overstated, that there is also a social and a distribution component there, and that of course heavily depends on your domestic uh, preferences and, and policies, but there is an enormous difference between the EU at large and the US in this respect. When you guide with a welfare state of some decency, a globalization, there need not be any dramatic negative effects, and the positive effect would wildly dominate. So I would want to make absolutely sure. But it's not just the EU, it is also worldwide. South-South trade is incomparable to 30 years ago. North-South trade and FDI, uh, it is all over the place, and it is therefore very important that we know what we should cherish and hold to our EU breast, if that can be technically possible. Uh, the second point I want to make, and um, I must say I'm very glad that Philippe goes into the same direction, is that in the EU, there has been a very uncritical acceptance of the linkages between trade policy and non-trade issues. In fact, um, I am with a number of other institutes and with my colleague in Septuanian Hu. Um, we are involved in another project. It has a name as sweet as Engage, namely Respect. It's also an H2020 project. And the topic is about exactly this. And SEPS does the EU China part because it's all very nice to do it with Korea. But if you do it with China, it's an altogether different ballgame. But there are many other countries, less extreme than China, that are not keen at all on uh, tying their hands too closely on this. And in fact, if we inspect where this comes from and what it does, the balance is not good. It comes, of course, heavily from certain advocates that are only interested in, be it human rights, be it the green or social side of sustainable development and or a link with foreign policy. And why do they like that? Because these, these other policies are very useful, very respectable. So it has nothing to do with the values in there that I would protest against it. These values need to be pursued by the EU, no doubt. And, and we should go on doing that. The question I ask is, should we do it via trade policy? It's that coupling that I have very great difficulties with. And if you um, if you go through a reasoning that in five minutes, of course, I cannot set up, um, you might come to the following three conclusions for discussion. Um, this coupling greatly complicates EU trade policy in many ways, also tends to slow it down enormously. It tends to introduce or magnify politicization, but of a very different kind than politicization ordinarily normal in, in trade policy because there are interests involved. And that type of politicization can be very costly for us. Uh, and three, it doesn't yield anything. If you look at what it actually yields, it a pitifully little. Uh, so um, I would say that we should reflect seriously on, on, the, on this coupling. And I want to end, because five minutes are short, and I see the worry in the eyes of Sieglinde, <laughs> but uh, is, is our work on China. I think we're all convinced that the way China is governed, and that has its external implications also for this topic, is certainly very far away from how we want to run our society. This is not what I want to discuss. This is obvious. The question then is, how should we deal with China in this respect? And we have, that is our topic. 
and both for the green part of sustainable development and the social part, we will soon produce two uh, rather long papers, if 100 pages per paper is, 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 is long, um, inspecting this for the last 25 years and how EU-China cooperation has worked on this. And EU-China cooperation there is outside trade policy. So it is exactly what I am advocating, that we should decouple this still pursue these values but via cooperation and what many people might not know or realize we, will, we hope to be able to demonstrate in these papers that particularly in the green side and to some parts not all of the social side this eu cooperation is much slower than we might wish but has been quite successful the china of today is radically different in these two fields and much more should be known about it. That doesn't necessarily mean that China is probably suddenly a saint, but that has worked. It is effective. It's, um, it works on constructive ideas. You have to invest a lot, but this is uh, quite successful, whereas um, otherwise frictions with human rights with China, although I understand fully why, haven't bought much. And what we now see with the Kai, that's my last sentence, is that all the uproar about this one sentence in the Kai doesn't help the Uyghurs. It doesn't help the people in Hong Kong. It just is an applause at the home front. And I don't think the Uyghurs are very help, much helped by that. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much, Shak, for provoking us a little bit. <laughs> further yes. in addition yes. to what yes. Philip already <laughs> said. Of course, the decoupling of trade and so-called non-trade concerns would go against the raison d'etre of a self-branded geopolitical commission, which tries to integrate these policy areas. But I will pass on the floor to Guillaume van der Loo, so, so we stick a little bit with trade before we move on to the CFSP. Okay, many thanks, uh, Sigline. Um, now I want to thank the, the organizers for the invitation, and I want to thank Ramses and Philippe for their uh, Excellent presentations. Now, in line with the topic of this conference, I initially wanted to briefly map out the key priorities for the EU's trade policy, um, in particular because we have, we have indeed, as Sigrid uh, mentioned, uh, the new uh, trade strategy that actually will be published normally by the end uh, of February. And normally, I mean, we can assume that this document will focus on, in the context of open strategic autonomy, on a more assertive trade policy by enforcing trade rules, the nexus between trade and climate. EU-US triangular uh, and China triangular trade relationship and uh, WTO reform. But uh, considering that I have five minutes, I have to pick my battles. So let me focus on a few issues with regard to the EU's trade policy that Philippe discussed, and that relates to um, the first issue that I mentioned, the focus on a stronger enforcement of trade rules or the EU steel toolbox to uh, tackle unfair trade practices, which, as Philippe seemed to suggest, um, have the risk to lead to a bit of a more protectionist uh, EU trade policy. Now, uh, with regard to the EU's enforcement uh, agenda and policies, we have the new uh, Chief Trade Enforcement Officer recently in place that needs to uh, streamline the different EU policies uh, in this area at multilateral level, at bilateral level, and through uh, autonomous trade measures. So let me very quickly um, allow me to give a few comments on the different enforcement um, tools on these different levels. Now, if you look at the EU's autonomous toolbox, um, we see a lot of new uh, or updated uh, instruments that Philippe also mentioned. For example, we have uh, the European Parliament approved last week the new uh, enforcement regulation, uh, which, as, as Philippe noted, allows the EU to, to retaliate when dispute settlement is blocked at the level of WTO panel uh, or under bilateral FTAs. Now, there are indeed some concerns that this enforcement regulation goes too far and that the EU is, for example, harming the very issue that it wants to protect and restore, that is a rules-based multilateral trade system. For example, the fact that the Commission now can basically unilaterally decide after panel procedures that WTO rules nevertheless are being violated and that it can retaliate sits indeed a bit uncomfortable, for example, with the WTO rules. So a lot will depend on, on how strongly or how often the EU will use uh, this regulation and whether it will pursue this first uh, after all other revenues are explored, such as the multi-party uh, interim appeal agreement. Now, linked to that, for example, the European Parliament insisted uh, also that the Commission should adopt an anti-coercive mechanism, and the Commission will propose this in, a in the next uh, six months. 
Um, and this new mechanism would allow the EU to take immediate action when a country forces or pressures the EU to act or to stop acting in, in a certain way. So to act against trade bullies. And of course, this was inspired by the EU's threats against EU cars or the digital tax uh, in several member states. Now, it is unclear how this will look like, but obviously the same concerns apply that you must make sure that this is proportionate, not punitive and, and WTO compatible. So I'm very curious to see how this will look like. And we will have to look at the say in the same way to other new instruments that are on the Commission's radar or are just recently adopted, such as the investment screening framework that Philippe also mentioned, the foreign subsidy instrument, and uh, also the next couple of months under the Portuguese presidency, they will also, or the Portuguese presidency aims to uh, revitalize the uh, international procurement instrument. So that's on the uh, autonomous front. Now, very briefly on the bilateral and, and multilateral uh, front. Now, if you look at enforcement of bilateral trade agreements, we see that actually so far the EU didn't very often use uh, dispute settlement procedures under FDAs. But now we have the first cases with Ukraine, with the South African Customs Union and uh, Korea. The panel uh, report was only adopted uh, this week. But there is actually still a lot of work on that front. Uh, because actually, if you look at the most important trade partners of the European Union, or if you look at the partners of the European Union, which are responsible for the highest number of trade barriers, the EU actually doesn't have a trade agreement with them with a strong um, dispute settlement mechanism, such as the USA, uh, Russia, Turkey, um, India, China, although now we have the agreement, but let's see how this will further evolve. But basically, the EU doesn't have strong uh, bilateral dispute settlement mechanisms uh, with, with countries with whom actually the EU needed it, needs it um, the most. Now, um, enforcement at multilateral level, I can be very short. I mean, this, of course, relates to the reform of the WTO appellate body. Um, and, and there I'm a bit more optimistic that um, obviously we have a new U.S. administration and the concerns of the new U.S. administration or that the U.S. has against the appellate body about judicial activism and the length of the procedures and so on and so forth. I mean, this, these will remain. But um, I mean, there is the hope that in any case, the Commission can really address the concerns uh, and negotiate with the U.S. and, and I, mean, I mean the other key WTO members to um, to to a new um, to, uh, to to in any case to come to an agreement on that. Whereas of course the previous administration was not at all interested in in, in tackling this uh, this issue. Uh, and also the Commission actually will uh, propose a new proposal on WTO form together with the with the trade strategy in the next couple of uh, of weeks actually. Now, the last two points, very briefly, is, and this relates to what also Jaki discussed, the enforcement of trade and sustainable development chapters on the FTAs. Now, um, this week, actually, we had the first report with Korea, which was, of course, quite, uh, quite an, 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 I mean, a, a new step in that direction. Uh, but the debate, of course, is not new, but will come back on the EU stable in the context of Mercosur, obviously, and the China uh, investment agreement, as Jaki already mentioned. So, um, of course, one of the key questions there with regard to the trade and sustainable development chapters is uh, whether non-implementation of trade and sustainable development commitments has to lead to suspension of preferences. And the European Parliament is pushing a bit carefully as well uh, in that direction. We also actually had a couple of member states. We had a, a non-paper from France and the Netherlands that uh, also made suggestions in that direction. But the Commission will be very reluctant to go in, in a sanctions-based model. Um, but nevertheless, we see that the Commission will come up with several new initiatives also in, in this area. We have the due diligence framework. Uh, the EU is implementing the global human rights sanction regime. And uh, obviously, at the heart of the debate in the next couple of months is how and to what extent should the EU negotiate pre-signature commitments, for example, with Mercosur about the deforestation or with uh, China on forced labor in a kind of a clarifying additional protocol um, or uh, a kind of a roadmap before actually the agreement is signed. And the final point, very briefly, that I want to make relates to investment protection, also something that Philippe mentioned. So the EU, because of course, this also relates to enforcement, and obviously the EU has been very active on that front the last two years, when uh, it developed its new investment court system to replace uh, ISDS, or the additional ISDS. And now, whether or not this is a good uh, development, obviously the new investment court system has significant improvements compared to traditional ISDS. But of course, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And uh, the EU has now this investment court system included in CETA and in separate investment agreements with uh, Vietnam, Singapore, and actually the Portuguese presidency wants to launch this as well with, with, with India. But of course, none of these systems so far is in place because 
Um, I mean, if you look at the case law, it falls under not under exclusive EU competences. So actually, these always, I mean, the investment court system always falls under uh, mixed competences. So in CETA, it doesn't fall under provision application. And with regard to the other agreements that I mentioned, I mean, they still need to be ratified, and this will take years. So um, actually, we still have to see how the system will actually work in practice. And obviously, these agreements will not be very popular for ratification, considering there are still key concerns vis-a-vis -vis the investment court system. Um, at the multilateral level, the EU is, of course, pushing for its multilateral investment court system. But here you see that the EU has really has problem, problems with uh, convincing other uh, countries who have their own, um, I mean, own mechanisms or proposals for um, investment dispute settlement. So uh, there it remains to be seen how, how, how uh, efficient or how successful the EU will be on that front. Um, I will keep it at this. I want to also react to a few um, comments that Jacques and Philippe mentioned with regard to the linkage between trade and, 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 and non-trade values, but maybe I can pick this up during the discussion and I will leave it uh, at this at this point. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Guillaume. Also for focusing on enforcement, a very important topic. And another big question uh, that it raises, whether we're just seeing a new assertiveness of EU trade policy given a harsher global context or actually new protectionism may, might be on the horizon. But let's uh, move on to the uh, CFSP. And I will give the word to Christophe Fillon to react to Ramses' presentation, please. Thanks very much, Singlinda. Uh, thanks also to Inga and Sasha for the uh, this opportunity to take part um, in in this timely conference. It's it's indeed nice to be uh, to be back at the college, so to speak, as I'm indeed sitting in in Oslo. Um, as you as you indicated, I, I shall focus my my remarks in the on the on the inspiring uh, paper that Ramses uh, presented. Um, um, and I shall start uh, by saying that I share the concern expressed in the paper um, about the, the current EU um, foreign and security policy. One, one cannot be entirely satisfied with what, um, what it is today in terms of uh, limited actions, and one cannot be satisfied um, either But what it is not, uh, indeed, because of the lack of recurring um, the, the, the recurring lack of agreements among the member states, the EU has uh, on several occasions, including recently, uh, prevent, been prevented from, uh, from taking uh, foreign policy decisions. Think, uh, think of the situation um, in, in Belarus, uh, in the Mediterranean, that led to the exercise of uh, veto rights by, by some member states. Uh, indeed, veto power continues to plague the EU foreign policy um, and, and, uh, and, and so I also uh, share the view expressed in the paper that uh, um, improvement is needed as far as, uh, as, far as uh, uh, decision making in foreign policy is, is concerned. Um, uh, indeed, uh, the qualified majority voting uh, suggestion is, is one of the ways um, this uh, possibility to have recourse to QMV in CFSB is not entirely new. Uh, you, you will remember that uh, the Treaty of Amsterdam already introduced that possibility um, whenever the European Council would adopt the so-called uh, common strategy that would trigger the possibility to use the qualified majority in the adoption of, uh, of implementing measures of, of such strategy. Now, three such strategies were adopted under the Amsterdam Treaty, but surprisingly, none of the implementing measures were adopted following the qualified majority voting uh, procedure. Uh, the mechanisms allowing uh, the use of qualified majority voting in CFSB have increased since Amsterdam, but there again, they have hardly been used, uh, if at all. Uh, now, if the time while the time might be a bit more uh, auspicious um, and while it might be more desirable than ever, as it's been argued by the European Commission, um, among others, to use uh, more qualified majority voting in CFSB, um, there are still many different views on this um, among the member states. And so um, using more uh, QMV in CFSB might not be 
the low hanging fruit that one could wish. I will just illustrate this point by referring to um, a, a non paper that was uh, signed by 22 member states, um, a non paper called Enhancing the Cohesion Effectiveness and Coherence of the CFSP. Um, surprisingly, in this non paper, many proposals are formulated. Uh, but um, using more qualified majority voting um, does not feature in that paper. Another illustration is, um, is the fact that uh, while the so-called Messerberg Declaration between France and Germany of 2018 mentioned um, the possibility to use more qualified majority voting in, in CFSP matters, the subsequent treaty that was inspired by um, this Messerberg uh, declaration, the Treaty of Aachen between France and Germany, does not even mention anymore the qualified majority voting um, as um, a possibility in the field of CFSB. Um, so qualified majority voting might not be as reachable as one might hope. And indeed, as Ramses alluded to himself, Qualified majority voting might not be the silver bullet when it comes to improving uh, the performance of the EU in the field of uh, foreign policy. More, I would argue, needs to be improved in, in the foreign policy making within the EU. And if I may, in the next uh, two minutes that I have left, I would like to flag up uh, three essential elements that need to, to be focused on. Many more uh, could be mentioned, but I shall focus on these three. Um, initiative, loyalty and credibility. The basic point I'm making is this, uh, qualified majority voting in CFSB in itself will not improve um, the EU's foreign policy performance much if it is not combined with uh, solid initiatives upstream defending an audacious uh, EU foreign policy and if it is not supplemented by a solid compliance mechanism to secure member state loyalty towards the European Union foreign policy. And last but not least, if there is no more coherence between what the EU does externally and what it does internally. Just a couple of words on each of the um, uh, elements. Uh, in terms of initiatives, um, two uh, improvements could be um, uh, considered. The first one is to do more justice to uh, uh, the key innovation introduced by the Lisbon Treaty, that is the establishment of the External Action Service. Uh, as um, a report um, um, about to be published uh, on, on the External Action Service on the occasion of the, its 10th anniversary suggests, the External Action Service really has potential still to become a genuine factory of foreign policy ideas for the European Union. Uh, and, and thus to deliver a, a distinctly European brand of diplomacy uh, to place the European Union in, in a leading role uh, on the global stage. And, and for that, the External Action Service still needs really to better use its core assets, be that the diversity of its uh, in-house uh, diplomatic expertise, the formidable network of delegations that the EU has uh, around the world, and the so-called integrated approach whereby um, um, uh, the EES has the ability to bring together the different strands of the EU's external action, including trade, and thus pursue a more strategic vision of the place of the EU in, in the world. The, the second innovation introduced by the Lisbon Treaty that still needs to be fully used um, with respect to expertise um, uh, sorry, with respect to initiative, um, that is the multi-hatted uh, high representative and vice president of the European Commission. Uh, one could uh, argue that uh, its formal rights of initiative in the field of foreign policy could still be used more actively and more audaciously than it has done uh, it has been done presently with the possibility indeed to trigger the use of qualified majority voting in council. The, the, the second element uh, of improvement which might need to be considered, uh, it's rather downstream and that is securing better compliance and loyalty of member states towards EU foreign policy measures, something which is 
lacking and which hampers any uh, authoritative foreign policy of the Union, um, as we may have seen more, more recently. And this needs to change. Um, and there are ways to improve loyalty. Um, um, monitoring mechanisms are timidly appearing in the field of CFSB, as illustrated by, by PESCO, but perhaps more radically, the obligation of cooperation binding the member states in the EU since the Lisbon Treaty uh, should also be used more actively to keep member states in line when, um, when, when foreign policy decisions are, are taken, including judicially. I could elaborate on that a little later. The last element um, which needs to be considered that's the element of credibility of the EU's external action um, at, at two levels. Um, credibility in terms of more coherence between the principles and values the EU is founded on, is founded on and which is, it is man, uh, mandated to promote externally on the one hand and its external action in different domains on the other hand, indeed like trade. Um, trade, in my view, cannot be immune from uh, political choices, uh, the, the, the coupling between um, strategic interest and, and trade policy uh, is, in my view, necessary. It is also legally required since the Lisbon Treaty. And this interest can be very diverse. One is, for instance, to support um, uh, WTO uh, operations and, and, um, and, uh, and the defense of multilateralism. Um, but the credibility of the EU's foreign policy also depends on the, on the congruence between the values that it promotes and their proper application uh, internally. The rule of law and democracy uh, regression that we are witnesses um, with horror um, uh, at the level of, of the Union uh, among its member states is, is a plague for the EU foreign policy, both in terms of uh, the EU's credibility on, on the international stage and uh, and its trustworthiness as an international partner. And so I would argue um, that uh, efforts uh, should be redoubled internally to enforce um, uh, compliance with the EU's values uh, as a way to uh, secure its credibility as a foreign policy actor. So in sum, and I'll finish on this, um, in addition to uh, QMV, the active promotion and articulation of the European interest at the level of, uh, of initiatives, the use of alternative decision-making mechanisms and improved compliance monitoring as well as enforcement are all needed to uh, improve the EU's performance as a foreign policy actor. Thank you. Singende. Thank you very much, Christoph. Many new great ideas uh, to the already long list of Ramses of how the CFSP could be uh, improved even without the treaty reform. And uh, of course, it also reminded me again of this, uh, you know, value discussion we already had that the EU global strategy uh, is based on another kind of oxymoron, which is principled pragmatism. So not just strategic autonomy, Philippe, but also principled pragmatism. <laughs> but finally, last but not least, we will turn to the student, uh, Juan Manuel Sanchez, who will give us his perspective as well on the foreign policy, please. Yeah, hello everyone. Good morning. Thank you very much for the time. I'll try to stick to my five minutes. Uh, talking about uh, the future of Europe, I want to bring uh, one professor in this house in College of Europe uh, to the floor. Recently, he quoted students, uh, Jean-Paul Jacquet, by the way, he's a legend in Brussels. He quoted, Europe now needs plumbers, doesn't need architects. And in this regard, I would like to say that uh, Lisbon Treaty seems to be delivering well, seems to be a proper toolbox. But maybe what we see, like in the PESCO case, the Lisbon Treaty in some aspects is a bit underused. And maybe those narrow reforms are what should emerge from this coming conference on the future of Europe. Also, I would like to make a comment on reading the spirit of the time. As several panelists have said, as, as well as in the paper by Professor Vessel, we are now in a world order, which is more, more, much more transactional than consensual and which is more interest-based than value-based. Uh, we can go to, uh, for, for example, to quote a US author, Robert Kagan, saying that the jungle is growing back. In this context, what is the EU doing? Well, in the process of designing a grand strategy, any government, any state or political actor, in this case, the EU, has to align ends with means. 
And in the process of doing so, we see at the EU level several internal frictions, some sort of disorder of entropy, which should be uh, should end. Uh, in this regard, I want to draw attention to some little reforms that do not require treaty change and that may optimize uh, and increase the efficiency of uh, EU's foreign action. In this regard, for example, we see the, the dichotomy, the, the duality between proclaiming strategic autonomy and pursuing, for example, European champions, but at the same time, based on criteria of uh, competition and uh, some commission DGs, which may be a bit conservative in this regard, mergers like the Siemens Alstom initiatives uh, have, been, have been vetoed. I want also to talk about another duality, which is the difference between compartmentalization and weaponizing, weaponization when you conduct your foreign policy. We see, for example, very well that with China, the EU has compartmentalized the different uh, policy silos. And uh, even if we with China do not agree on international law or human rights, we are able to negotiate investment deals. Uh, Recently, in the last five years, we have been entrenched in a dynamics of weaponization which, with Russia, which hopefully the coming trip by high representative to Moscow will put to an end. But uh, also, as, as Sven Biskop from the uh, Egmont Institute uh, recently said, if you weaponize, you never end conflict. So we need to align that grand strategy, the European Union's grand strategy, with uh, this uh, more transactional world order. In 2016, the EU tried to do this. We, uh, uh, we issued the global strategy in 2016, and one of the chapters talking about uh, the European regional order, uh, one of the goals we pursued in the strategy is selective engagement. But we see that selective engagement with Russia is not working. We are entrenched in a self-reinforcing dynamic of uh, uh, trade retaliation and, and, and defense mechanisms. Another uh, reform which would not require treaty, treaty change has to do with what I would quote, no offense to anyone, the Schumann parochialism. We see very often that the different institutions that are uh, in Brussels representing the EU, the, the European External Action Service and some parts of the Commission have diverging, sometimes mm, irreconcilable goals when it comes to projecting power outside. We need to reconcile that. Initially, thanks to the Lisbon Treaty, the double hat of the High Representative and Vice President of the Commission was supposed to solve this, and it achieved a lot of coherence. But uh, we need to step forward, and I think uh, that kind of uh, unified action between Commission and External Action Service needs to be achieved. And also, the last comment is on the EU's uh, genetics. The EU is quite prone to what I would call tactics unleashing strategy or a low politics, so to say, unleashing high politics. We see an example of this. This has been very useful thanks to the Monet method of going step by step to build the common market, to build the EU at intra. But when it comes to projecting power at extra, the EU seems sometimes to shoot in uh, his own, uh, in her own foot. Uh, for example, in the Ukraine crisis, part of the high politics rivalry has emerged due to uh, association agreements negotiated by sometimes trade officials. Okay, so there is a bit of uh, reflection that we could have on that. I leave also the idea for the rest of panelists. And finally, uh, on post-conflict management, on defense and security policy, I think one uh, doctrine that the EU could adopt from the UN framework, it is starting to emerge, is the doctrine of stabilization in the management of post-conflict. It may seem to some as a reduction of ambition, but uh, I think it is uh, a more realistic uh, way of approaching a post-conflict management. Stabilization as a doctrine that assumes that conflict never ends and that imposing a liberal Western uh, political structure into a state like Somalia or some other areas after a conflict does not uh, really caution the conflict. the conflict. The conflict stays latent. And if you want to resolve it or at least uh, caution it or smoothen it, you need to count on local actors and gatekeepers. Uh, the st stabilization doctrine has been theorized, for example, by Professor Anna Junkos of this house and also by uh, Professor John Karlsruhe. And finally, all this looking at the future of Europe. Let's hope that following Charles Michel, our president of the European Council, Europe will not be a playing field, but a player. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the debate. 
Thank you very much, Manuel, uh, for this nice intervention. Uh, I unfortunately, I have to keep an eye on the time. I would have normally given back the floor to the two speakers, but I would suggest that we combine it with some questions from the floor that Inge Hovare is looking at so that we can save a little bit of time. Inge, could you maybe group some of the questions and then we give the floor to uh, Ramses and Philippe first? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Siglind. Uh, also, a big thanks to all the speakers for their very thoughtful and insightful uh, papers and comments. Uh, this has also shown in the many questions that we have received. So, uh, what has been said so far has really been thought-provoking. Uh, I don't think you'll have the opportunity to mention all the questions, uh, because there were really a lot. Uh, but uh, so far as I could see, they're basically grouped in three big categories. So I would like to take them also under the three headings, if you agree, Siglinda. Uh, the first would be uh, a lot of comments and questions on this link between the rule-based system, uh, trade and non-trade uh, aspects. The second one, uh, second category of questions relates to the link between uh, CCP and CFSP. And then a third category of questions would uh, relate specifically to uh, trade policy of the European Union interrail in relation to Brexit. Uh, so if I may perhaps uh, read some of the questions with a based system. Um, one uh, question is, uh, dear speakers, which norms could be, in your view, included in the hierarchy of norms? the EU's trade policy that Mr. Debar was talking about. Another question relates to the loss of the competitiveness of the EU uh, with respect to technolo technology sensitive uh, sectors, uh, with respect to China and the US. And the question there is, what is the trade strategy that the EU should adopt in order to become more competitive again? Is that not precisely the enhancement of the rule-based system? Um, Another question specifically for Jacques, the coupling of trade and other policy aims is advocated and proposed by the Commission itself, for instance, in the Green Deal. Just to make sure I understand your point, do you think that the Commission's view on this is the result of lobbying? And I would like, if I may, uh, to add a question uh, on my behalf, because this is, of course, a very important uh, debate. And I would like to link it back also to yesterday when we were talking about democracy and the rule of law. And we were talking about uh, uh, the fact that perhaps we would also need a charter on democracy as we have a charter on fundamental rights and to link them to those horizontal principles that apply throughout treaties. Uh, we have Article 2, TEU, we have also Article 3, 5, uh, with respect to external relations specifically, where the Treaty of Lisbon now says, in its relations with the wider world, the EU shall uphold and promote its values. And uh, this is horizontally applicable throughout the treaty. So my question uh, is, why would trade policy not obey to those horizontal principles? What would be the arguments uh, to single it out? Uh, shall we first have these questions and then go back to the other two? Siglinda, do you want yeah, to do? Yes, please. I would maybe uh, give the floor to Philippe first and then to Ramses and then see whether one of the panelists, uh, Jacques was mentioned, uh, would like to respond and be as brief as possible so we can cover as much as possible, even if it's selective. Thank you. Uh, thank you. A uh, lot of questions and uh, um, obviously I'm, I'm familiar with uh, Article 21 of the Treaty of the European Union or uh, the need for coherence and the values and the objectives throughout the different policy areas. Uh, my approach is, is, is however, uh, very pragmatic uh, in that sense. And the way I see the, the, the pursuit of the, of the realization of the objectives I mentioned in Article 21, for instance, uh, is that the uh, common foreign and security policy and the CCP are different tools to achieve these objectives. And that my point is that by uh, blending them together, uh, you actually uh, nullify the impact uh, that European Union may have. Uh, why is that? Because uh, the European Union is a giant in the field of international trade. It's one of the largest trading nations. However, and I know it's an exaggeration, Ge geopolitically and strategically speaking, the European Union is a dwarf. <clears throat> and we have seen 
uh, whenever there was a, 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 a substantial challenge of the of the European Union security interest, uh, whether it was in Libya or former Yugoslavia uh, or Syria, uh, the European Union's action uh, has been completely ineffective. So what does this mean? Uh, do we really want to uh, uh, to uh, uh, make an instrument that works like the common commercial policy, which has been a tool to spread uh, our values uh, as far as uh, sustainability are con is concerned, as far as data protection is concerned, as far as product safety is concerned, uh, by means of uh, the importance of the European market, by means of, of uh, uh, negotiating with countries uh, access to our market uh, in order to, uh, to say, sorry, you're not pure enough uh, you're not uh, up to the, the democratic standards that we apply internally. So we don't want to do business with you. We don't want to conclude agreements with you. Uh, in the end, this will actually, in my view, uh, lead to a net loss of influence and, and values uh, in, the, in the European Union's external action. So I think let's see the, uh, the CCP and the common foreign and security policy as different tools to achieve the same objectives. And, and that is really what I'd want to say is not to contaminate a CCP action uh, by very lofty and I, I, I ideals, uh, with, uh, which I absolutely share, but I just don't think that we should uh, make our, our common commercial policy dependent on them. Uh, that is, that is uh, one point I want to say. And, and the best example is obviously uh, our relationship with China. Um, we cannot just ignore China. We cannot just say we won't deal with you. We won't conclude an investment agreement. Uh, we will not take any action to make sure that uh, you that will negotiate with China, for instance, agreements on the limitation of industrial subsidies. Uh, we won't do that with you because you are not respecting our basic core values of the European Union. I think that would be counterproductive. Uh, we could have a, a more philosophical debate. Uh, about foreign policy, to what extent foreign policy necessarily needs to reflect the internal values or, or the values you respect in your internal system. Uh, but uh, I'm not going in there. I just want to say, pragmatically speaking, we have to separate the, the objectives of the uh, um, common foreign and security policy of the CCP. Thank you very much. I would uh, give the floor to Ramses to react from the CFS, CFSP point of view on these values versus interests debate. Thanks very much, Siglin. And, and, and for the sake of time, I will quickly also address uh, one or two other things, if you allow me. Uh, starting with uh, Juan Manuel, thanks very much for for this uh, for this intervention. Very interesting, um, and and uh, we'll, we'll keep that in in mind also for the for the paper. And and let me pick up one thing. I, I as a lawyer, I very much feel like a plumber rather than an architect all the time. Uh, that has to do with the fact that we need to find solutions, and that it brings me to Christoph's uh, point as well. I mean on initiatives, on compliance and loyalty and on credibility. Um, I think many of those things, as you also indicate, Christoph, are in the treaty currently, but are underused uh, or, and more importantly, perhaps, um, are difficult to enforce. So we have a loyalty obligation. In fact, we have an additional loyalty obligation in the CFSP chapter. Um, and the problem with that is, is how to enforce that. Um, the, the, the formulations are quite strict. They all use terms like shall do this and shall do this. Um, but the enforcement, of course, is very difficult. And I think one of the challenges here is also to see how we can do that. You mentioned monitoring systems. Um, we, we have to look also at other policy areas where they have done that as well. Social policy, for instance, not using the hard law things, but trying to use softer uh, measures to see if member states can learn from each other, benchmarking, things like that. Um, so that would also be perhaps things to uh, to address. Uh, keeping an eye on the time, also on on trade and and and, and human rights. I think I I see Philip's point very well. I mean, CCP is very successful. Please don't touch it. <laughs> uh, I I see that point. At the same time, I don't see. Um, that there is a blending of CCP and CFSP if we're talking about human rights. Human rights are not just a CFSP item. Human rights are one of, it's the, one of the fundamental things of the entire European Union in all the policies. So I don't see that as a distinction between CCP and CFSP. In fact, and that will be my, my, my final sentence, 
I would not be against in exploring the option of, let's say, in, in terms of trade agreements, thinking about something like Copenhagen criteria, where you look at certain states, uh, whether you, to what extent you actually want to, want to have a trade relationship with them, and more particularly, under which conditions. So coming to or developing a template or a list of fundamental things that should be in each and every trade agreement um, is something perhaps to explore um, for the for the conference on the future of Europe as well. Thanks very much. Uh, maybe Shaq, there was a question directed to you. Thank you, Sieglinde. Well, indirectly several. Um, there's also the question on high tech and what strategy uh, in terms of autonomy, sovereignty, or all these uh, empty words are um, are, are doing that. Uh, I will not address that. Um, very interesting, but then um, you have to reorganize the conference schedule. Um, but but for the most part, high tech issues we should first of all solve domestically. Domestically, that means the EU and its companies, not to forget. Uh, should invest in these things and we haven't done it or we haven't done it enough but let me go to the other one which is really um, very much what I had hoped would happen and Philippe has given part of the answer I want to complement that um, I agree fully with what he just said uh, two minutes ago um, and um, uh, but let me go a little bit on this question of is this the result of lobbying but it's much more complicated in this lobbying the general idea, and we are all academics, although Philippe also works as a non-academic, but surely he's also an academic. Um, of course, we can talk about coherence and academic logic. And that is one thing you can look at it, but it's not the way it works. Not at all. It is the, the practice and its effectiveness works against the EU and doesn't help these values outside. Uh, unless we have already a sort of closeness in IDs with the Canadas and the Japans of this world, but where that is not the case or not sufficiently the case, there is no harvest, but trade policy in, and, 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 and therefore the economy and uh, uh, suffers or at least doesn't gain anything from it. And that is because the advocates of this coupling in the past and still today uh, what they want is the following, and it's not meant to hurt anybody in this discussion, but um, the advocates want, they come out of policies that have just been explained, are relatively weak and too soft. So what they do is to borrow the reputation and strength of trade policy to get more cloud, effectiveness and strength. But that's at the, at, at the expense of the results of trade policy. I now simplify, but that's the core of my story. So, and we should reflect on that. Is that in the interest of the union? And moreover, does it improve human rights in, in, in countries where this is very problematic? So that is what we should look at. We shouldn't look at the theoretical classroom discussion on coherence. Coherence is extremely damaging if you push it too far. I once chaired in SEPS a meeting with a number of MEPs on trade policy. And the one of the Green Party gave 11 conditions. She said, of course, we are free traders, but only after 11 conditions. And the whole, yeah, the whole hall laughed because that would mean we have to cut relations with trade and investment with at least 100 countries, if not more. So we have to be serious in this thing. But lobbying has one, that's my last point because time is short. Um, there is other, another aspect of lobbying. The advocates of this coupling are very often NGOs and certain people in political parties, also in the European Parliament, that um, keep on harping on this. But when you see how they actually work, is they don't give anything about the trade aspects of it. They don't judge CETA on the CETA treaty. They only zoom in in microscopic little elements of the annex and here and there one or two articles and don't care about what CETA means. You see that, for example, in how they work now in national parliament. That also happens a lot in Brussels. So the lobbying has very adverse, or if you want perverse effects that academics often don't want to see. Thank you. Uh, I know that Guillaume had a short point to add. 
Yes, indeed. Well, we indeed we can discuss for a very long time on, on the nexus between trade and, and non-trade policies, but I'm a bit more optimistic uh, on that point than, than, than Jacques and Philippe, um, because uh, just look at the last 10 years since the European Parliament is fully involved in, in the common commercial policy. And of course, this is very often being cited as one of the key reasons uh, why the EU is doing a, a bit of an overstretch in linking trade and non-trade instruments. But can one actually mention one very important agreement or um, internal EU legislation that was blocked by the European Parliament because it really torpedoed an agreement or a piece of legislation because it didn't really meet certain specific standards or it didn't go enough um, to meet um, human rights or, I mean, climate or social goals. I don't think there is actually one uh, example. If you look at um, trade agreements, the last two trade agreements um, or the last two trade agreements or most important trade agreements, we concluded with two communist countries, uh, with China and with Vietnam. And of course, you have to see the investment agreement with China, what will happen, but the one with Vietnam was even ratified by the European Parliament. So uh, I'm quite confident that the European Parliament is actually quite responsible. And of course, you have several MEPs that go too far. And I mean, of course, there is a, a political game that plays there as well. But I'm quite confident that even in the case of Mercosur and the um, investment agreement with China, after a long debate and some creative solutions and some joint declarations and statements, um, a, a solution um, can be found. And you never know what will happen. But I think generally, actually, the problem is not that big uh, as sometimes it is uh, portrayed. Thank you. Let's see if whether Christoph or Juan Manuel would like to have a short addition. I just state uh, uh, something um, we don't have time to discuss, but I think I think the, the the distinction we're talking about is is more theoretical than it it is practical. Um, uh, I, I really don't see how trade is completely disconnected from all sorts of political values. I mean, the trade policy of the European Union and before that of the European Economic Community has always been used to achieve certain political um, interest and certain political purposes. There's no such thing as a pure trade consideration and pure liberalization of world trade. Uh, uh, trade policy has always been in, embedded in, in, in broader um, strategic political concerns, and that's even more so since the, the Lisbon Treaty. So uh, I'll just say that both legally, practically, politically and historically, <laughs> that this distinction uh, simply does not stand. Uh, Juan Manuel. Yeah, very quickly, and just to finish, uh, I agree with the previous speakers that uh, values, European values, are not decoupled from our foreign action. However, I would like and, and shouldn't be decoupled, it should be one of the ingredients. However, I would like to call uh, about the danger of making foreign policy and making trade policy contingent on values. If we try to have little Europe's around the globe, we will end up without those little Europe's and without trade influence and without foreign policy uh, influence. Just a reminder, the world is like a school playground and there are bullies. And in front of these bullies, the Europe cannot behave always in a protocolar, in a, in a protocol way, in a, in a diplomatic way. Sometimes you need to be assertive. And in that assertiveness, sometimes values shouldn't be in the first priority place. Thank you very much. Now I'm turning to Inge to see whether we have to call it the end of the panel or whether we can go on for five minutes. I know that there's a break scheduled now. Yes, but we still have a lot of questions that have been posed through the day. So it, I think it might be good if we could just address some of them uh, briefly. So uh, if everyone agrees, we could perhaps continue for another five minutes. Uh, and if I may uh, go into the linkage and also the more institutional setup, because that's also going to be important for the future of Europe conference uh, and read some of the questions posed there for a quick answer. Uh, how do you appreciate a possible reaction response of member states to enlargement of the role of the Commission and the European Parliament in sensible, sensitive areas? Uh, another one, is it possible that the European Parliament is driving the use of CCP for CFSP purposes because of its exclusion in the latter forum? Is it effective in this respect? Question mark. Another one, is it really a good idea to have qualified majority in the field of sanctions? Would it not lead to a fragmentation of the CFSP and ultimately to loss of effectiveness of the EU sanctions? And the last one I would like to mention in this category, 
Is the reason to combine trade and CFSP objectives not also due to the wish of member states to maintain their influence in the ratification of the then mixed agreements? Uh, in some member states that even uh, regional parliaments have to ratify. Okay, so we have to pick and choose. Uh, maybe we start again with the speakers, Ramses or and then Philip or whoever wants to go first. I, I, if you allow me to just pick two quick ones and then leave, there is another one, the last one on mixed agreements. Uh, it's also interesting. I'll leave that uh, for Guillaume. Uh, <laughs> Um, on the uh, on the European Parliament and Commission influence on, uh, on 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 CFSP and in particular, would the member states actually accept uh, a role of the more supranational institutions uh, in CFSP? No, probably not. Um, but, but as we have seen over the past uh, past decades, this is a process, um, and member states since the beginning of the 1970s um, have been accepting and seeing the um, seeing the um, advantages of a more integrated CFSP. Uh, so this has been a very long process and, and involving the Commission and, and the European Parliament more um, in CFSP, more formally, I should say, yeah, because informally, of course, they're, they're always there. More formally in CFSP um, is something to be discussed and, and, and put on the table. And, and let's see where that goes. Um, and, and it's some of the member states are actually very keen on having that process. And there's a few others, and, and one of one of them has just left us, so that is perhaps uh, helpful, um, that have been been um, holding back this, this type of processes. On QMV and sanctions, yeah, it's it's it seems to be sanctions are, as, as I indicated, uh, are the most frequently uh, is the most frequently addressed um, policy area in CFSP decisions. Um, so it would be extremely helpful also in quantitative terms um, to to have something happening there. But again, um, I fully agree with all of those who would say, uh, does it does it really help in the end if you have a number of member states actually expressing uh, that they have been against imposing those sanctions? Uh, this would seriously undermine the might seriously undermine the legitimacy of those uh, sanction regimes. Thanks, uh, Philip. If you pick some questions and no, yeah. I, I would like uh, to agree with what Wessel just said. As uh, um, I believe, I believe that one of the reasons why we see uh, these uh, efforts at linking uh, non-trade values uh, to the CCP is partly due to the difficulty in the decision-making process uh, in the CFSP. Um, so in that sense, I would be in favor really of on certain areas of CFSP to go to uh, um, qualified majority voting and to facilitate the decision-making process, which hopefully then will uh, take away some of the pressure uh, that we see in CCP by uh, NGOs, by uh, parliaments, uh, trying to bring their CFSP agenda um, or to, to provision through uh, the CCP. Uh, so in that sense, I think it would be very helpful if we could see uh, a more uh, flexible or a more uh, efficient and dynamic decision-making process uh, in the CFSP. There was a question on mixed agreements. Guillaume or Christophe, you're both experts. Guillaume, go ahead. <laughs> Well, very briefly, I mean, also on that front, I'm, I'm quite, I mean, there were some positive evolutions because uh, on the one hand, of course, member states needs to, or member, the national parliament of member states need to be involved in trade agreements as these trade agreements cover um, increasingly um, a, a large, uh, I mean, uh, have, have increasingly broad scope. Um, but of course, that's something different that, that these trade agreements should always be, be mixed and that they should be involved in a ratification procedure. So now, I mean, after um, the important case law of the Court of Justice that basically confirmed that everything falls under exclusive competences with a few notable exceptions, we see that the EU is now splitting these trade agreements and trade agreements on one hand, which are EU only and mixed and putting the, the mixed elements in a separate investment agreement. And we have that now with, uh, for example, with Singapore and Vietnam. Um, and you see there are good reasons for that because, for example, CETA, uh, please note that only 12 or 13 member states have ratified CETA. Only this week in the Irish Parliament, there is a big problem. Uh, and so far, actually, the EU always avoided with creative last minute diplomatic solutions to convince member states that are threatening to, to, uh, to, to torpedo a trade agreement. But there are limits to that. And to a certain extent, that is being solved by splitting trade agreements. But um, you see that, I mean, there are still some trade agreements on the radar that are, will not be split 
Uh, I'm looking at the Mercosur FTA because that is in, in the context of an association agreement. So there are exceptions made for that. I don't know actually what the commission proposal will be for the China investment agreement. And because that's really a, a unique uh, uh, animal in that regard, um, combining some investment issues with market access issues. Um, so um, you see that the commission is doing an effort and uh, engaging member states through the council, for example, by submitting um, to national parliament um, negotiation um, proposals for negotiation mandates and a draft text. So obviously the responsible is also at the, at, in, I mean, at, at, at the part of the, at, of the national parliaments to scrutinize their respective member states uh, in the council and to be involved as much as possible. And I think the commission is doing what it can to keep national parliaments in the loop. Um, but um, yeah, this of course triggers then a bigger debate on, on uh, efficiency and democratic legitimacy, but I will not open that can of worms at this point. Uh, Christophe, would you like to add anything? Two, two small things. Thank you, Siglinde. One on mixity, um, just to make the point that CFSP does not entail mixity. Uh, quite the opposite, actually, the use of CFSP to include um, uh, foreign policy and security matters in external agreements might be a way to avoid mixity. We've seen in the past um, foreign policy matters being um, uh, included, but without involving the EU qua CFSP, choosing the member state instead. So the point is, including CFSP matters in an external agreement, a trade agreement, does not ipso facto entails mixity. Plus, including CFSP matters might actually lead to the trade agreement being concluded as a pure trade agreement. I mean, the Court of Justice has um, um, uh, enlarged its, its uh, absorption um, uh, jurisprudence to, uh, to CFSP matters. Um, um, so, so again, CFSP does not entail mixity. The second point is uh, QMV and sanctions. Um, there again, I would just reiterate the point that without some kind of compliance mechanism, um, QMV and sanctions might not be a, a, a very good idea. Um, I would say the nuance uh, would be to, to start with the renewal of sanctions à la rigueur. But again, without some kind of mechanism to secure compliance with uh, EU sanctions adopted in the context of CFSP, then qualified majority voting might be actually detrimental. Thank you very much. I'm afraid looking at the watch, uh, we have to stop so that there's a real coffee break before the next panel then can start at 11 sharp on time. Uh, Inge, I hope that's fine. Uh, and I would like to thank everybody. I think it was a very lively and excellent panel and uh, we all have a lot of things to reflect upon. Uh, and I think we don't agree on everything, so that's good. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Celine. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. And we're back at 11 sharp.